Here we go. Thanks, Sophia. Appreciate it. Uh, so again, this is <clears throat> one of our uh, political education events for Debt Collective in what we call Jubilee School. We've been running a series of summer school series uh, events around different debt types. Um, so we have been having conversations around Warren debt. And Sophia gave an amazing presentation on that. We've had presentations on labor and debt. We've had presentations on the university and debt. And part of the aim here is to explore the many ways in which debt plays a fundamental role in neoliberal governance and different types of exploitation and uh, expropriation. We also believe strongly that debt is a way to get to the heart of racial colonial capitalism. And so as much as we want to abolish debts, we also recognize that we have to deactivate the systems that create the debts in the first place. And so part of our aim here is to think not only about how to abolish a variety of debt types, but also how to eventually create different political economies in which these debts would not exist, at least in their current iteration. So tonight we're lucky to have a dear friend um, that I have recently come to know through different work with Labor Notes. And Karama Maria sent me a very long bio. So I'm, just gonna... <laughs> I'm just was, gonna say- It was the one I had in the email. You don't have to read all of that. <laughs> I'm just gonna say a couple of things. First of all, I've had the great pleasure of working with Maria on a project where we're writing a book with Sophia as well and some other people on institutional debt. And um, we did a retreat in Puerto Rico uh, where we got together to study. Um, and learn from comrades, compañeros in Puerto Rico, and also talk amongst each other and study different strategies, um, not only about the ways that death is changing the higher education landscape, but also about how we can resist. Uh, and so for those of you that are from Puerto Rico and others that are unfamiliar, uh, some of the strongest resistance to debt regimes is coming out of Puerto Rico. And we think uh, we need to be having more conversations about what that looks like, how it works, uh, especially here in the mainland, and also recognizing that, you know, it's mainland politics that are pushing promesa and other things that Maria is going to talk about that's causing this problem. So Maria, uh, other than a friend and compañera, is an associate professor of Hispanic studies at the University of Puerto Rico in CAI, and the president of the Asociación Puerto Ricana de Profesores Universitarios, so the uh, Puerto Rican Association of Pro University Professors. She's taught in the U.S., at Emory, Purdue, and other places. Um, she's been in Puerto Rico or back at Port in Puerto Rico since 2016, has published a variety of different books. Um, research focuses on cultural production of Muslims, Jews, and Christians in the 17th century, and overall is just an amazing person. So <laughs> thank you. So happy to have you here. Uh, the way this works is Maria will give a short presentation and then we'll open up the conversation for questions and dialogue. And if at any point you want to ask a question or make a comment, um, please include the word stack in the chat. That's not my photo. I'm not at home, but you get the point. Y otra cosa, si quieres hacer una pregunta, comentario en español, yo puedo traducir para todos y no hay problema para escribir en español, entonces hacer una pregunta en Spanish. So if you want to make a question or write a comment in Spanish, I'll translate for folks. Uh, other than that, Maria, it's all you. Okay, so can you guys see the... The screen, I'm sharing the screen. Can I, okay, perfect. Go um, okay. I heard something, but I don't know. No? Okay. Okay, so um, Jason already introduced me, so I don't wanna, I, I, I don't need to go over that again, but um, I'm glad to be here. I think it's important for everybody that is in any sort of struggle to share their experiences. We all become stronger when we do that. And it's always good to talk about Puerto Rico and the colony of Puerto Rico, because many people don't know many of the things that happen here in one of the territories of the US. So I will start by saying that Puerto Rico is, is a group of islands that has been a colony of the United States since the US invasion in 1898. And for this class, uh, we will explore the intersectionality between colonialism, debt, and the neoliberal agenda in Puerto Rico and the strategies of resistance from within and beyond the University of Puerto Rico. So we'll try to intersect all of those topics. 
Um, so first, uh, I will start by explaining what is Puerto Rico's debt and kind of contextualize that in very simple terms. I'm a literature professor. I'm not an economist. My economist friends make fun of me when I try to, to explain some of these things um, because I always do it very generally. So uh, Puerto Rico is struggling with a debt of 74 billion uh, of outstanding bonds. Um, give me one second there. Okay. Okay, Puerto Rico is struggling with a public debt of 74 billion of outstanding bonds and 49 billion of owed in pensions. It defaulted on its debt payments in January 2016. In a spur of the moment, the then governor of Puerto Rico, his name was Alejandro Garcia Padilla, in front of the cameras got really, really nervous and said, it is very simple, we just don't have money to pay. Those words were enough to rattle the crate. Who was this governor of a forsaken colony in the Caribbean to question the idea of paying a, a debt to Wall Street? We will not attribute any bravery to his words since he spent the following months trying to take those words back. But the reality was that Puerto Ricans were questioning the legality and legitimacy of the debt. Puerto Rico's debt has not been audited. A real audit will let us identify the culprits of the debt, see and trace the illegalities of that debt. So the thought of questioning Puerto Rico's debt rattled the US Congress into political action. And as a result of that colonial relationship that we have with the US, PROMESA law was signed by President Obama to restructure Puerto Rico's debt. PROMESA, which is a very sarcastic term, stands for Puerto Rico Oversight Management and Economic Stability Act, but the word, the word means promise, right? A board of unelected Wall Street bankers was imposed to control all finances on the islands and renegotiate the debt. Title III of PROMESA law allows Puerto Rico bankruptcy-like proceedings to restructure the debt. The problem with these bankruptcy proceedings is that the people and their elected officials are not the ones negotiating the repayment. The fact that the FOM, which is the name that I will give the Junta from now on, the Federal Oversight Management Board, the fact that the FOMB is the one representing Puerto Ricans' interest and negotiating our debt repayment with the bondholders and vulture funds is appalling. Unelected bankers on both sides of the table are negotiating the payment of an unaudited and illegitimate $74 billion bill and refuse to establish and recognize essential services. The fact that the FOMB decides the future of Puerto Ricans shows the lack of democracy and colonial abuse that normalizes the debt economy. So many of us question here the morality of debt repayment, right? We're here in an activity of the debt collective. Uh, but when the colonial ingredient is added, especially in the colony of Puerto Rico, our struggle becomes larger. We start asking other questions as well. Who owes who in a colonial relationship? Is it ethical to pay an unaudited and illegitimate debt? What if debt repayment has a human cost, right? So Rocio Zambrana in her book, I don't know if you know this book, a really good one to understand Puerto Rico's uh, situation. Rocio Zambrana in her book, Colonial Debt, The Case of Puerto Rico, explains that debt functions as a form of coloniality. Debt actualizes, updates, reinstalls the colonial condition. It is not surprising that the situation in the US colony of Puerto Rico reveals capitalism's madness because debt has become suffocating for the population. In a debt economy, austerity measures and budget cuts are imposed on the most essential public services, healthcare, energy, water, housing, social services, and education. Our current debt struggle in Puerto Rico goes side by side with decolonizing our country, but also with the aftermath of two hurricanes in 2017, a string of earthquakes, and yes, that exists, a string of earthquakes in January 2020, the two-year shutdown of the COVID pandemic in Puerto Rico, Hurricane Fiona in 2022, and the privatization of essential public services. The budget cuts imposed to all public agencies to pay an unaudited debt to vulture funds in Wall Street is not ethical, it is not fair, and it has a huge human cost. It is disaster capitalism at its prime and colonialism at its worst. The struggle to survive the debt economy defines the lives of Puerto Ricans. And these are two questions that I would like us to 
discuss more at the end of the presentation because there's a thin line between to survive and to live right to have a full life to be resilient and to resist it's, there's a very big difference between the two so i briefly contextualized the data economy in puerto rico and now i want to see how it connects to the university of puerto rico since its arrival the fund has aimed against the university of puerto rico more than any other institution even when the UPR is not in substantial debt, it hasn't defaulted and it hasn't defaulted on its loans. And why is it? So we have to ask the question, why? Why does the Financial Oversight Board has the UPR as one of its main targets? So this is a question we need to analyze deeper. Why is a university, a place of education, the main enemy of Wall Street in a colony? And for me, this conversation is important to have with Americans because we're seeing a trend in the US that is important to open discussions about more, right? To discuss more. And I think colleges and universities, especially public ones, are revolutionary spaces. Wall Street's main enemy in Puerto Rico is the UPR because the University of Puerto Rico is a social project and has been and still is a site of political resistance. That is why the Financial Oversight Board has insisted on dismantling it and cutting its budget in half. So people ask me, okay, there, yeah, Maria, but there are big differences between the role of the University of Puerto Rico in Puerto Rico and public colleges and universities in the States. And sure, there might be some historical differences, but there is a shared potential. And there is a quote that I learned from Jason and Connor, and I think I, I saw Connor coming in. Uh, it's a quote from Asata Shakur when she's talking to CUNY students. And she tells them the following, there is a tremendous revolutionary potential in the colleges of America. There is a great need for a student movement to be built based not just on student rights, but on human rights. While practice without theory bangs its head against a brick wall, Theory without practice lulls itself to sleep. There are so many things about that quote that we can go on all night to discuss. But it's important to know that the revolutionary potential of public universities is the result of that balance between theory and practice and the transcendence from student rights and things that are internal of the university to human rights and issues that are external to society, right? It is not new to say that our ideas need actions, that theory without practice lulls itself to sleep. Yes, we all know that and accept that. But our actions need the renewed creativity that theory brings to the struggle. So we do not bang our heads against a brick wall. And this is particularly important for our conversations because many of us are linked in one way or another to different university communities, right? Um, everything we do in the classrooms, the texts we read, the histories of the world, the discussions to make us question everything, the research we decide to pursue, the academic work is capable of renewing the fight and the struggle, especially when fatigue and frustration take over. So yes, it is true that universities reflect the societies they are in. And yes, we live in a capitalist society and universities are part of that but they can also be laboratories of anti-capitalist futures and other possible worlds, right? So I hope that I have convinced you just a little bit that to fight capitalism and to dismantle the debt economy, your colleges and universities are ideal places to launch that fight. Transforming higher ed communities is key in the construction of anti-capitalist worlds. That transformation has started something is waking up in the mainland, right? And we have seen it in debt reveals and strikes like Rutgers or the University of California to just mention a couple of ones of the last semester. And I look forward to seeing more of this transformation with incredible hope and certainty that we can achieve change. So let's go back to the UPR because I know you guys want to talk about the UPR because I know um, it has been, the UPR, has been wounded, okay, by the Financial Oversight Board. These past six years have been terrible. And what is going on in the colony and, and, and why we still defend it is because we still believe that universities are essential sites of resistance, right? And 
So the University of Puerto Rico, to just give a brief uh, summary of its role, the University of Puerto Rico was founded in 1903, only a few years after the US invasion. As the main public university of the country, it has a mission to serve the peoples of Puerto Rico in the pursuit of knowledge, to make knowledge accessible to society and to contribute to the development of culture. While it started as a place where only the privileged could study, it grew to become a university of the masses throughout the second half of the 20th century and as part of the economic project of the Commonwealth. The UPR has a history of political activism and it became a site of anti-colonial resistance. Many of the political struggles of the second half of the 20th century that had a lot to do with independence, with decolonizing the country, took place in the UPR. In those, in those decades, students were strongly persecuted, illegally profiled, and even killed by police in the UPR. The UPR is the main public university in the country. It has 11 campuses uh, throughout the main island to make education accessible to all geographical areas. It is the most prestigious university in the country with the highest scores of entry, the lowest cost by far for students, and the higher retention and graduation rates. It has the best programs and 75% of all research in Puerto Rico comes out of the UPR. Besides being the central hub of higher education, the UPR is the main provider of healthcare in the country. The best hospitals are part of the UPR's medical school. The UPR serves the country in many ways. And this, I'm gonna say this, and I know Jason is gonna get a little bit itchy, but for every dollar invested in the UPR, because I, I know you don't like this argument, but for every dollar invested in the UPR, a dollar 56 cents is produced. So the university serves as an economic multiplier. And if Puerto Rico is experiencing such an economic crisis with the debt economy, the question is why the fund, the one institution that can help the country overcome its financial crisis? And the answer is simple. First, because the Federal Oversight Board doesn't want Puerto Rico to get out of debt. It's a way of, of control, right? That controls us. And secondly, because the UPR is more of a resistance site than it is a return of investment. And yes, I am personally skeptical about the neoliberal discourse behind seeing universities as economic multipliers and giving value to education based on return of investment. For me, universities are essential spaces of society regardless of their return of investment. But even within the financial logic, dismantling the UPR does not make sense which brings us back to the enormous potential of public universities to be sites of anti-capitalist resistance. So when the government imposes austerity to dismantle public higher education, to pay a debt to Wall Street, we have to ask who are they responding to? They are responding to creditors and the bankers rather than the people they represent. By doing so, they failed in their main responsibility of service to the people. And the people respond to that betrayal in different acts of subversion and resistance. Sambrana also in her book explains that protests employ tactics of subversion, but also inversion, refusal, rescue, occupation, aimed at interrupting the operation of debt. End of quote. Today, we will talk about the acts of subversion around the University of Puerto Rico. We will present some examples of the efforts of students, professors, and university employees defending the University of Puerto Rico and the larger fight of Puerto Ricans against the debt economy because they are both very connected. So wh what are the consequences of these austerity measures internally in the university? So the consequences of the budget cuts for the UPR are severe. For employees, it meant salary freezes, increase in healthcare costs, elimination of tuition waivers for children and family. My kids cannot study for free now. Increase in workload in class sizes. I used to have 15 to 20 stu class st uh, students per class. Now I have around 30 students per class. Benefits like the retirement pension plan are being threatened directly by the financial oversight board. Another consequence of budget cuts is the increase in the number of adjunct professors that in 2022 constituted 44% of UPR's faculty. So almost half of our faculty are adjunct professors, not even lecturers, adjuncts in part-time. Um, 
and they have part-time contracts with salaries below the poverty line. Less than 20,000 per year to be more clear, right? Very dire working conditions. For students, the increase in tuition rates has made it impossible for many students to pay their education. 13 out of 16 types of tuition waivers for athletes and other student activities were eliminated. 13 out of 16. The general credit cost in 2018 was $57 per credit. In 2023, it increased to $157 per credit. This is undergrad level. So this is a 175% increase in tuition in just five years. This has drastically lowered student enrollment and the students that enroll cannot live off the Pell Grants. They need to either take loans or have two or three jobs to, to pay their studies. Today, the UPR has a reduced student body that is overworked and part of the low wage working class in Puerto Rico. So the UPR now has 50% of the budget that by law it is supposed to receive because the Financial Oversight Board has the power to go over the law, right? The decay of buildings, classrooms, and campus infrastructure is visible, especially after hurricanes and earthquakes. Law number two, states that the government's funding of the UPR must be 9.6% of the revenue, of Puerto Rico's revenue. The chart here, and you might wanna take a picture of this chart because it's good information, has, an, has the average contribution that every state it makes to their higher education institutions from their general fund, right? So we have from Utah, which contributes 24.4%, to New York, which is very little, almost 5%. Um, the average contribution in the states is 11.8. The Federal Oversight Board, since their arrival, have argued, and they part from the premise that Puerto Rico spends way too much on their university, which we know is not true. It's not even average. It's, it's 9.6 is less than 11.8. Puerto Rico right now with the budget cuts is currently investing only 4.9 of its revenue in the University of Puerto Rico. So it's the lowest territory. So how, how do we fight back? Right? How, how this panorama that feels like a huge monster, how do we fight back? So there are little strategies that have worked. And so I was asked to talk about the different strategies of resistance that have, we have been using in the UPR to fight austerity measures. And I must be honest and say that the struggle before and after the pandemic has changed a lot. The lockdown during the pandemic disarticulated the movements against the debt economy. We are starting to recuperate and bring people together once again, right? But it has been tough. And one of the main challenges has been to rebuild the student movement because the pandemic broke the continuity of student activism. Freshmen tended to learn from the more senior students' political experiences and, and, pass, and the passing of that wisdom from one generation to another was interrupted by the pandemic. But we will focus on successful strategies. And if you want to discuss any of them further, we can do it in the q and I'm just gonna show a couple of them. One of the things that we find most useful when organizing commu university communities is create a united front between the different university sectors. Uh, the different sectors of the university, faculty, staff, and students in all of their form must work together when we're talking about austerity and when we're talking about debt. Even when their demands and problems seem different, every injustice can be tied to the austerity measures, to that common thread. The different groups at the UPR started organizing multi-sector meetings, concerted actions, lobbying together. This is one of the meetings we used to have in 2017. We used to have every Wednesday night, we used to have meetings with the students to catch up on what was going on. Um, the important thing is to maintain communication. We even have a WhatsApp chat where we have all the student union leaders, all the employee union leaders, all the faculty union leaders. And every time something comes up, we talk there and we do meetings and stuff to, to try to deal together, right? So creating that united front and giving it continuity, it's important. Another thing that we feel it's a strategy that works is the idea of protest and propose, right? Protesting is important, but also proposing alternatives and answers is, is important. One of the main issues, and this is just one example of the pro protest proposed, was university reform. One of the main issues in the UPR governance was the partisan politics within the university administration. 
And these are the people that do not defend the UPR against the FOM because they have political ties to Wall Street. Um, we argued that protesting also comes with proposing and we wanted the opportunity to propose this change from the bottom up. So students, professors, employees, and representatives of the surrounding campuses met every two Saturdays for years through hurricanes, earthquakes, and pandemic to write a university reform that was democratic, representative of the university community. In January, 2022, we presented it to the PR Congress. It lost by one freaking vote. But the mobilizing of all of us in all fronts made it possible to get a second round. And now it's gonna be presented to the PR Senate sometime in the fall of 2023. We hope that we can push this time and, and convince the, that vote that didn't, that worked against us last time. Um, and here, because we were in the middle of the pandemic, we had to do a, like a lot of, of, of promo online. We had to do videos where all of our kids would talk about the university they wanted to be. That's one, one of the videos my son participated in. Um, wait, okay, there. So the retirement is another point of, of inflection, right? And another issue that has helped in mobilizing workers is our retirement pension plan. The mm -hmm. PROMESA uh, became really interested in our pension fund and has blackmailed our administrators into dismantling it. We have been fighting them in several rounds for years since before the pandemic till last week, right? The last shot was last week when the UPR's president decided that all new hires will not go into the pension system, which is a way of slowly dismantling it and pushing us towards bankruptcy as well. So some of the, uh, this issue, which is a very concrete issue, labor issue, made us, uh, it was easy to mobilize people to defend that particular issue and talk to them, hey, this retirement thing is connected to the bigger debt economy, to the austerity measures imposed on you. Um, another good strategy is positive media campaigns. Like not, not everything has to be negative. We need to focus on the positive sometimes, even if it's hard. So something that we realized that was in order to defend the university, we needed to convince people outside the university of the wider importance of the UPR. So we are creative and started a media campaign titled UPR, Mi Universidad, like emphasis on that possessive, my university which included radio beats of testimonies of people that did not study or work at the UPR, but whom their lives had been changed by the university. The campaign also included the signing and painting murals in the different campuses with students, professors, and employees to solidify that, uh, that collaboration between the different sectors. This was fun and solidified the relations between the different sectors. We started at change.org that reached the 40,000 signatures in a matter of days asking the governor to stop cutting funds to the UPR. And it worked because that year the budget cuts were put on hold, only that year. There's also a, a phrase that I like to say, creative ways of resistance are important. Um, and this is just one example. We decided to do a book in the middle of the pandemic. One of our main labor concerns was the situation of adjunct professors, a group that is living under very precarious conditions. We knew that UPR was exploiting professors, but we needed to make noise. And we published a book of short stories and poems written by adjunct professors about their lives and struggles at the UPR. Puerto Rican writers, and here are some of them, collaborated with the Apu to give free creative writing workshops to adjunct professors. And we had many virtual meetings. The process was both cathartic and healthy. We published the book in the summer of 2021, and we have been making a lot of noise with it through book presentations everywhere we can. That other picture is about, uh, we do teach outs once a semester uh, to, where we assign the book to the students and talk to the students about the situation of adjunct professors. Uh, so this is just an example of how to organize people, bring people together to share their stories and then use those stories to demand change, right? So the UPR is one of the main victims of the debt economy. So it is important to get involved beyond our campus. So some of the examples of how we were involved outside of campus, one of them was the UPR student strike. And you will say, well, why, that it has to, why is that external to campus? This, uh, this strike was really interesting. The student, try, uh, student strikes and walkouts are powerful weapons to fight back. In 2017, the year where we first encountered the junta, 
UBR students went on strike for three months. The demands were internal demands about the race and tuition and budget cuts, except for one. And this is, this is the one that I wanted to talk about, except for one, the public audit of the debt. The students were demanding the public audit of the debt. They were the first group to do this and the first group to actually meet with the FOM. The strike was systemic and was approved in an in-person student assembly of the entire system. And it's 11 campuses, the School of Plastic Arts, the Conservatory of Music and the UPR High School. It was historic with the participation of more than 10,000 students. And that picture here, that one that's talking right there was one of my students of UPR Calle. And that, that is a student assembly of the entire system. This was historic. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that brought them together was the idea of the, we need to do something for the debt economy itself. So we want the public audit of the debt. Yeah. Another example was uh, the summer of 2019, the protests. I don't know, that was kind of like our Arab Springs, but that, that was the Puerto Rican Spring. Uh, talk, taking part in bigger struggles that affect the entire country has made us stronger as a university community and more visible. In the summer of 2019, Puerto Ricans forced the governor of Puerto Rico to resign. This was not a UPR win, but we were all there. We worked with other groups to organize and coordinate protests and all of us together made the governor resign. Um, another example was a, the vote for governor, like something we need to understand as public higher ed communities is that we, we need to take more control of of the states, of the governments of the states, right? And so when elections were underway, we decided to interview, to do a debate of all the governor's candidates. Why we wanted to do this? Because every time you see the debates in the TV, they, they don't touch all the topics we wanted to. So we had interviews with each of the candidates for an hour where we grilled them in all topics related to the university and the debt and the auditing of the debt. And it was, fun because we grilled them, but also it, it forced them to put that in their agendas uh, when facing us. And that is an activity that works now that we are looking forward to the, to the elections next year. Um, also, of course, another strategy is unionize and seek collective bargaining um, for all sectors. Support each other's efforts for organizing and fighting the administration. Collective bargaining and organized worker power is a must. The threats to working conditions inside the UPR have pushed the different organizations in the UPR to unionize and seek contract bargaining. In the last few years, uh, these three, uh, <clears throat> three associations became unions and ours is in the process, the faculty union is, is in the process of becoming an official union as well. We're waiting for the elections to be called, hoping that it would be around September, October. But when the debt economy also pushes people into organizing, and we're seeing that also in the United States, we're seeing like a, a, a I don't know, a, a new a rebirth of, of union movements, right? Also within our unions, we have to make some work and progress as well. And I'm not gonna talk a lot about this and this is external to the university, but many of the professors that were in my faculty union decided to make this group Junta de Mujeres Sindicalistas, where we get together with other unionized women from different jobs, uh, fab uh, fabricas, industry, costureras, uh, nurses, every uh, different jobs. And we come together to empower each other, not only to occupy the spaces within our workplaces, but also to occupy leadership roles within our unions. And if you guys want to talk more about this, this is also important. Um, so to conclude, so to conclude, it is important to understand that we are not alone in our struggle. And in the sixth declaration of the Selva La Candona, the Zapatistas say that all, to all the dignified and rebel people who resist and fight against injustice all over the world, they say the following. As there is a neoliberal globalization, there is a globalization of rebellion. Groups who exist all over the world, but who, do not, who we do not see until they shout enough of being the spice and they raise up and then we see them, we hear them and we learn from them. The greatest challenge of this movement is to keep up our fight against the debt economy while at the same time we continue weaving our re resistances together with others 
that are also fighting against capitalism beyond our campuses and beyond our countries. People in the UPR and in Puerto Rico face the effects of debt repayment in every single aspect of their lives. So one of their biggest challenges is the fatigue of the few and the apathy of the many. When the crisis intensifies, there is so much frustration and there are so many fronts that have to be covered that people get exhausted. Those who lead the efforts burn out and often feel alone in the struggle. The challenge is to find that balance where we can live and fight without draining ourselves. And this quote from Shishek is one of my favorite ones. He says, revolution is not experienced as a present hardship we have to endure for the happiness and freedom of the future generations, but as the present hardship over which this future happiness and freedom already cast their shadow. In it, we already are free while fighting for freedom. We already are happy while fighting for happiness, no matter how difficult the circumstances. So we need to embrace what we are fighting for while we are fighting for it. And because it makes it real and it makes it possible and we free ourselves from capitalism when we fight to end capitalism and we take back what we are owed when we fight against the debt economy. So our fight against the debt economy will not be quick nor simple. It will require us to put our bodies and beings in the line of fire without losing hope. And I want to end this talk with some words that might serve as the ending of a book some of us are writing together, but we still don't know if it's going to end that way or not. But I, I'll, I'll still share them with you. So may we embrace the fight against debt with optimism. May our words encourage others because revolution needs inspiration. May our colleges and universities serve as sites of resistance, empowerment, and promise. May our actions and intentions be filled with the confidence of anti-capitalist futures. May we lead with hope as we organize our anger to transform the places we inhabit within and beyond the university. So thank you very much. Let me stop this. So now we can answer questions, Q&A. Can we just give a round of applause? That was incredible. <laughs> Damn, Maria, really. Wow, really, Amelia, that was, that was amazing. Um, yeah, uh, the floor is open for questions and answers, uh, or discussion rather. And if you would like to ask, Ask a question or make a comment, just type stack. And si quieres hacer en español, yo puedo traducir para todos. I can translate. Any questions about any of the strategies about how we see universities as sites of resistance, about resilience versus resistance, or survival versus living, surviving versus living? These are things so, we need to ask ourselves. I see Sofia on stack. Go ahead, Sofia. Uh, thanks so much, Maria. This, is, this was just really amazing talk. Um, and I, I love the pictures. You had a slide uh, for that initiative for women mm -hmm. from different unions. And I noticed that that like the top middle picture was uh, a picture with like that I think said said like, what is your debt? Yes, or, yes. And can you talk more about that? Because I'm so curious, like what people said and what the conversation was like and, and what organizing came of that. So what we did this 8th of March, in March 8th, uh, the protests are always in the afternoon. So we had like this big workshop around debt and about female bodies being in debt. So everybody, it, it was a whole day of workshops. And the first activity, when you came in, you sign in your name and you had to put in this board your debts there, right? And the debts would just go over the faces of all of us. And then uh, we discussed different quotes. We did like, a, we put quotes of different authors about that, um, good quotes and evil quotes as well. Um, and, and people would react to them and we did subgroups. So we dedicated the day to understanding our relationship as women and as women workers with debt with the debt economy and how, how debt is illegitimate in every form, period, right? That was part of the conclusions we got everybody to, everybody got to those conclusions on their own, right? But it, it was part of what we wanted, the objectives of the activity. 
um, Justine, and then Pedro. Uh, hello, everybody. Okay, my light's not that bad after all. Okay, great. So, <laughs> um, um, this was fantastic. Thank you so much, Maria. This is truly inspiring and gives me so much hope. And your comments about you know, the regrowth of unions in the United States. I'm just like, yes, here we go, right? <laughs> <laughs> but um, one of the things, and I, I remember seeing you at Labor Notes in Chicago, actually, as well. Oh. Um, and uh, I'm really glad to be reminded of the book that was published about adjuncts' lives and adjunct mm -hmm. stories. Um, <laughs> Because in, in the United States, and at least in, in the university and community college circles that I'm a part of, there's a lot of really strange ideas from full-time and tenure-track faculty about who adjuncts are and what mm. they do. Lots of ideas that like, you know, oh, this is just a second job for them, or they're just phoning it yeah. in, or all this kind of stuff, right? Um, and so in many ways, there's seems to be a barrier to solidarity based in those assumptions about what's happening with adjuncts and all of that. And so I'm wondering if you have come across that in your organizing in, oh, in Puerto Rico and what strategies you've seen that have been like really successful in overcoming that. Well, actually, we had that conversation when we were defining our our union, who was our union going to represent? And um, a lot of us, most of us, the majority, wanted to include adjunct professors and we did, but it, the, the talks were tough because there are certain privileges from tenure and tenure track professors that sometimes don't even see themselves as working class. It was incredible when, when I was giving some of the workshops to organize where we're like, yes, you are part of the working class. But austerity has helped us a little bit with that. Not because austerity is good, but because they're seeing for the first time some of their benefits being threatened, right? And something that we did with the book and that we've been very vocal about because half of our faculty are adjunct professors. It's saying the only difference, and I got into trouble one day for saying this in the microphone, <laughs> the only difference between an adjunct professor and I is luck. I was lucky to get to the university at a certain point, but they're not second class academics. They're, they're doing the same job as I am doing. They're doing their research. They, their students love them. So the only difference is luck. And we keep like, enforcing that discourse and I think we've been successful in doing so um, and 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 bring them bringing them in the project helped us bring bring many of them in as well and that was also one of the reasons we chose literature instead of you know academic essays because in the literary aspect and with the workshops you're able to manage your characters right and you're able to to appeal to a more emotional connection with the public with the reader and, and that helped a little bit. Of course, that the pandemic, we, we started the project as soon as, a, a, I think a month before the pandemic started. So all those workshops and everything were online, but still it, 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 worked, it worked well. But yes, we always have to argue about that, that they're not second class academics. They're just the same. They just have different working conditions. Uh, Pedro, please. Buenas, can you see me? Si. Oh, perfecto. Many, many thanks, uh, Maria, for the presentation, not only remarkably informative, but as um, has been said, inspiring as well. Thank and you. I learned a lot. I, I wanna, first of all, agree wholeheartedly that um, the state attacks the universities systematically, you know, mm -hmm. particularly public universities, the elite private universities seem to weather many storms at public universities because they are sites of resistance, right? There are areas indeed with which develop alternative conceptions of the role of education and transformation of society and quite often radical in its content. So your observation regarding the direct attack on the University of Puerto Rico for its historic role in challenging the various permeations of uh, permutations of, of colonialism is, is, I think, an astute observation and valid historically. Um, I want to introduce another consideration. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a minor consideration and a more significant consideration. The minor one is that these activities by the state against the universities distract students from what their task is, right? To acquire the knowledge and the skills that mm -hmm. allow them to be productive and to make contributions to society, right? Much of the energy is redirected towards survival 
rather than to growth. And ironically, that process survival also creates this certain, the connections that you talk about, right? It creates this, this dynamic, this movement. But at the same time, it's also distracting students and taking them away from this other task, right? So I, I think there's this conscious policy as well, right, by the universities to redirect student efforts from learning and research and engaging in questions for transformation. So that's one consideration that, I mean, I've, I've found in my own experience. Um, but the other is to think about the attack on the University of Puerto Rico as part of a larger project of reconstituted, reconstituted colonial capitalism. Right. Puerto Rico has moved to a new transition, right? It's no longer an island in which value is extracted from workers through, the, through surplus labor extraction. It's a, becoming increasingly an area where, of direct exploitation, mm -hmm. right? Direct exploitation. It has been a transformation of the economy as we know, right? Um, from manufacturing to what we see now as social influencers, uh, crypto uh, investors, this whole slew of kind of non-productive capital that comes to Puerto Rico as a consequence of Law 60 prior to that 2022. So one way yeah, I've been trying to, 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 to understand the attack, not just on the University of Puerto Rico, but also uh, public education in general, is that the reconstitution of the economy that's taking place under the control of FOMB is going to require fewer educated people, fewer trained people, right? What we see is basically an effort to de-skill the population. And this goes hand in hand with what we see as, as res continuing re restriction or retraction of the labor market that requires skilled workers, right? So I see the attack on the University of Puerto Rico and the attack on public education as an attempt also to not only devalue, but disempower potential working class. Oh. And the economy itself is, as we know, an economy that no longer is contingent upon generating revenues from workers because there's massive unemployment, 40, 45% poverty. Right? So I try to, to at least begin thinking about the attack on university and public education by creating then this labor pool, denied the opportunities to develop skills either in school or in the shop as part of reconstituting Puerto Rico's political economy. Now the question is why? And one can basically link it also to the question of status, right? A poor, uneducated, sickly population, right? It's going to make a less compelling argument for statehood. The United States never wants statehood anyway, right? So I mean, here I'm speculating, but the idea is that the FMOMB is part of a larger than dynamic to reconstitute what the colony is. Yeah. To magnify the levels of exploitation and make it increasingly relevant to the American imperial project. Just the thought I had on, on, on education and 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 I and I agree with your second point completely. It's it's the the idea of a Puerto Rico without Puerto Ricans. That was actually one of the things that the governor said in the chat that was leaked. One of the main uh, things that got people into protesting in the summer of two thousand nineteen, uh, because we knew that the exploitation and the attacks on the working class are are extreme i mean they went directly to one of the strongest unions in puerto rico which was the UTF. UTF. this was the electric company workers this union has has a historical role in puerto rico and they went directly against it to just shatter it and they shattered it and that's what they're doing with the university of puerto rico as well mm -hmm. so yeah we we are dealing with very very tough times and not very hope-filled times we're still working on things and 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 trying to see how we can have more of a say so in public policy. And the elections of next year, we are looking at that with, we, we need to get involved. We, we cannot, unions in Puerto Rico cannot keep leaving, leaving it up for the parties to decide and bipartisanship to decide. And, and I think there are possibilities there as well. With the, the first point you brought about the students being distracted, I disagree. I disagree. I think 
that is one of the things that has uh, worked against student movements in the US. The idea of they need to focus on their studies and get their professional degrees and that's it. I think our students learn a lot, a lot, sometimes a lot more when they are part of the struggles and when we have these assemblies and meetings and the, the, the experience of the 2017 strike. I started at the UPR in January 2017 and the strike started in February. And when I went into campus, it was a, a similar experience to Occupy Wall Street. The students had a whole laboratory of a whole different life there. And they had talks and they invited professors to give talks and they were alternative sites of education. And I feel when their students are that connected, they're a lot better professionals because they are completely connected to the social life. And that's one of the things that I know we need to work with in the States. I taught at Purdue and at Carnegie Mellon University. And faculty and employees are more mobilized than students in, 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 in US colleges and universities. And it's because of that. They're alienated from society, right? They're in their, in their sororities and fraternities and in student life. And they're like away from all of that. So one of the, uh, the things that they used to uh, chant in the process is like, a, El maestro en la calle también está enseñando. Teachers in their streets are also teaching and students in the streets are also learning. So that is something that we, we have embraced at the UPR for, for decades, right? And, and our, part of the UPR experience and being the most important university where the most important professionals come out of is because that experience is also very political and that does not distract them. We still have the higher graduation rate from all other universities that do not have that political life. This is a fascinating conversation. Um, we want to have Connor ask their question and then maybe one more after that and we'll wrap things up because I recognize it's getting hey, late. Hey, Connor. Nice to see you. Hey, Maria. Oh my gosh, such a powerful, <laughs> inspiring talk. And thanks everyone so much for gathering tonight. Um, I'm here with my comrade Elise and uh, George. <laughs> Hello, um, Maria, uh, we just had a telepathic moment because I was wondering how the student strikes um, have changed the experience of teaching and learning in La Yupi. So in the time of the strike, a whole different kind of doorway of what education can be. Um, if you would be willing to share a little bit more about that. And, um, uh, you know, when I read the uh, quotation at the very end of your presentation about the Zapatistas saying when people will shout ya basta then we hear them and we're learning from them very much so the city university of new york cuny is mm -hmm. a sibling institution with upr our struggles are also your struggles and vice versa mm -hmm. and we now have as part of our board of trustees uh robert mujica who is the head of the promesa board and so if there are specific uh, kinds of calls to action or specific ways that we can strategize across our two institutions to take down Promesa, to specifically target Mujica and these other power brokers who are doing these horrendous things to, to the island from specific outstretch our arms in collaboration with you all. And gratitude again for this powerful presentation. Thank you. There's, there's so much to do from the diaspora as well. Um, the FOMP has an expiration date, even though they, they don't want to, they want to stay there forever. So whoever takes power of Puerto Rico's government in January 2025, whoever signs up there ha will have the power to say, well, PROMESA says that you need four uh, balanced budgets and we already covered those four balanced budgets, you need to get out and I'm not going to listen to you anymore, right? But we need politicians that have that have the ovaries to do that, right? So that's why it's so important now, yeah, I'm not gonna say both, you know. It, it's so important now to have some, some sort of say of what's gonna happen in the elections next year. And as unions, this is something that we're starting to talk about because unions in Puerto Rico is the opposite of the US. They don't wanna get together with politicians at all. They don't want, they have nothing, they want nothing to do with politicians and I understand why. But there are many conversations about alliances, alliances of, of people that are not within the two uh, main parties 
that are interesting to see because we need people there in January 2025 to tell the junta you need to go, even if 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 you want to put me in jail, right? I, I need you need to go. You're done. The law says you're done because they're gonna find another way to try to stay, right? And how does the Huelga experience changes all of us? Well, there are good things and bad things, right? And and there's a, it's always a tense moment. Nobody wants a strike, right? It, it, nobody wants a strike. Well, you go to a strike when you don't have any other resource and it's always a tense moment. And many of the strikes before La Junta came, the, La, La Junta is the FOM, uh, were strikes against the administrators. So there were direct negotiations with university administrators. Now we're also, the strikes also have to do with La Junta. Like the last strike in 2021, was because of one of the restructuring of the debt. And it was a tense one because it wasn't very successful, but it, it was important to do it. It was important to say ya basta, right? Um, but it was it was tough and it destroyed part of the student movement as well. Uh, because it, after the pandemic, they, they weren't, there wasn't so much um, political education as, as there was before, right? Or, or continuity. So that's one of the things that has been tough after the pandemic. Uh, and just for sharing that compa. One quick comment, and then we, if anyone else has a question, uh, one thing that strikes me is we have versions of Promesa and the Oversight Board in the on the mainland in the United States. So we've seen it in New York. We have one Detroit. Detroit. We have one in Pennsylvania that did a lot of damage in Philadelphia that still exists mm -hmm. that can be activated during times of austerity. And so I think one of the Interesting is not the right word because it's darker than that. Is mm -hmm. to see how these different tactics of creditors slash their friends show up in different places at different times and replicate themselves in order to do what you said, which is manifest control and power. Mm -hmm. um, and and it goes against democracy because it's the most undemocratic thing. You put right. unelected officials in the table to negotiate for the people, and the people are not represented in the table. They're bankers in both way, in both sides. Um, yeah. So it is it is undemocratic. And I and I think it's one of the hard things here in the United States mainland is how to even get to build the consciousness to attack these institutions and these mm -hmm. different mechanisms. It's so hard to even get people to think along these terms um i do want to say if anyone has a question or comment i would love to hear it if not then i would be curious to hear how the hell do you get ten thousand students in an <laughs> auditorium to do a vote on a I, seen I remember that day being like a little girl i was like this mother hen super super proud of the students and i wanted to go there but i couldn't go there because you know we cannot impose ourselves but i really wanted to and i kept telling my students please send me videos i just want to know what's going on it was complicated for them it was complicated because student assemblies in, in the uvr are tense tense are very tense in the different campuses so putting all of them there together but it was also to ratify the strike. So people went there already with, with an agenda, um, but it was a very long, it was a whole day thing. They even went to, to get lunch and come back and it, it was, yeah. But I was so proud of them. These were the same students that created these laboratories of different societies within campus. They had huertos, they were growing food. They The way they were organized was incredible. Um, they were just not organizing in the capitalist way. They were sharing everything, and it was super interesting. And I think for a future round of political education, it would be really wonderful. Maybe we can you can connect us with some of the student leaders, and they yeah. can us how they did that that work. Yeah, and we need to reach them again because these these students from 2017 already graduated, and because of the pandemic, they couldn't pass on many of the experiences they had to the new ones. So now we have them in other places. Sometimes I bring them to give talks to the other students or the ones that are in grad school. I call them again. It's like, hey, I, would, I would have a meeting with student unions, the young ones, please come um, and see if it's a little bit contagious. But it, it was an amazing generation of students that we had in 2017. They actually sat with the Junta. They were the first group in Puerto Rico to sit down with the FUM and they, the fund didn't even know what they were talking about. The students were more prepared than the, these bankers about Puerto Rico. And they asked tough questions and they 
put their demands on the table and it was really embarrassing for the for the bankers that came in because they had just arrived to Puerto Rico and they didn't know what was going on here and negotiate all of our financial activities just like um, and the students gave yeah it was nice to see them there but we're regrouping again and I'm hopeful that that it we're starting up. This is the May May Day was a good day to get people out again and 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 start taking control of the country again. Yeah, and just as a tool, um, Maria, Sofia, myself, and some other comrades have developed tools to help people do debt audits yes. of their university. So if you want access to those tools, we can send them along to you. Mm -hmm. um, are there any more questions or comments before we call it an evening? All right. Well, then, once more, thank you so much, Maria. This has been fantastic. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. Uh, there will be an archive uh, video of this. We are creating an archive of all the events. Um, please check out Debt Collective, debtcollective.org for more um, Jubilee School events. The next event is on labor and debt and how debt empirically has been shown to squash the desire to go on strike. So it should be good. Um, and if anyone here ever wants to do a session with Debt Collective, please do contact me. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. Have a good Thank night. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Nice seeing you guys. La lucha continua. Hasta pronto, Maria. See you, Connor. Big hug. Um,